organizational radio station represent? That's fine, I'm there. Take it away. So, that's the first question. First, a warmest greeting to you, Ante Braga. Um, I met you about four years ago, not longer now, with um, Emmanuel Paul Jove a few years ago. Yes, yeah. Um, my name is Brother Dougie, um, from SLR Radio. Also, I've got a nice kind of voice. It's around personal development. And I'm glad to be um, in your company, you know, hearing some very wise words from you. Um, my question will be, um, who was your mentor? I heard you talk about so many of them, like Dr. Fairn and so forth, but who was the one who really took you under your arm, so to speak, you know, and really pushed you? Okay, I uh, appreciate the question, but let me modify your question a bit. Uh, back in the States, uh, we don't use the word mentor. Uh, Brother Wayne Nobles, who is um, former president of the National Association of Black Psychologists, taught us uh, the history of who mentor was. You know, we, we are English speaking, which means that we internalize our world through the minds of, of English men and other Europeans. And it's important whenever we have the opportunity to, to modify how we see the world through their eyes. And uh, mentor was uh, the person who uh, Odysseus or Ulysses uh, turned to, he was about to participate in the Trojan War uh, to, to rap uh, to, to uh, rampage and murder and kill foreigners. So he left his son in the charge of mentor to raise him, to educate him while he was off fighting the Trojan War and went through his odyssey. So in that context, we see mentor as an accessory to murder, an accessory to crime. Uh, so we prefer to use uh, a more appropriate term, an African term, uh, jegna, which is uh, Amharic, and an Ethiopian term, jegna, J-E-G-N-A. The Jegna is a defender of the culture. And if you all are familiar with the works of uh, Haile Garima, a brother who uh, 25 years ago uh, wrote and directed the film Sankofa, uh, the logo of his <laughs> film company, Michael Duke Films, is an image of a Jegna, two Jegna, male and female, brother and a sister with a shield and a spear, defending their culture and fighting for their liberation. So the, the Jegna, who have been responsible for training me and putting me on this path. Uh, the two brothers, uh, well, I, I, I like trinities, I'll go with three. So uh, three souls who I, uh, who I love dearly, who are, uh, who are now ancestors, but whose uh, presence continues to shape my life on a daily basis. Uh, one, uh, I would say, Baba A.C. Hillier, uh, who I met um, 30, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, um, um, this month, actually, uh, began developing a working relationship with him. And it was Dr. Hilliard who wrote the introduction to my first book from the Browner file in 1989. Uh, the second uh, person who was responsible for my uh, growth into manhood was uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, who wrote the introduction to my second book now, Valley Contributions to Civilization, which I see sitting on the chair there. So it was Dr. Clark who, uh, in his grandfatherly way, uh, was always there to, to answer questions and to offer uh, words of wisdom, guidance, and direction. And the third person who was also instrumental in my development as, uh, as a human being and as a, an African man is uh, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, mm. who was uh, from my hometown, Chicago, who was a dear friend, a personal friend, as well as a colleague. And um, she was, she was um, a colleague, she was a friend, she was, she was my doctor, she was my family doctor. Mm. Uh, and, um, her sudden uh, loss last July was uh, another loss like Dr. Hillier's loss that, that shocked us all, that saddened us all. And uh, we realized that you know, we have people in our presence uh, who we oftentimes don't truly value until they're no longer here. Um, and it just reinforces in my mind uh, the importance of, of knowing those people who add value to your life, honoring them, and making sure that their lives are as comfortable as possible while they're here. They should not work, they should not want for anything. 
you know, as they have given their lives and their careers to us. Uh, we have an obligation and responsibility to take care of them, to assist them in any way we can, and to perpetuate their legacy. So those are the three uh, shining historical and, and academic stars in my life who have demonstrated to me uh, how an African man should behave. So I appreciate your question. Sure. All right. Next question. Thank you. First of all, thank you for saying that. Um, so, uh, my name is Rasmetsi, and I'm conscious radio. I also have an organization called Libya House, uh, which is a major organization. And that's the kind of what I want to ask you. You mentioned about images. And what, what, what I'd like to ask you is what effects do these images that we see portrayed? Because I see you talking about empire, and I don't know if you've done one on Get Out, but empire certainly. How negative are these images and how, how, how do they affect our psyche and how can we, what attempts can we make to counteract this? What can we do more like, for example, the things we've done to self? Sure. Like these negative sure. Images. Uh, and, and again, I appreciate you all thanking me for coming here, but my thanks, uh, I have to extend my thanks to you all because I only come where I'm invited. So if you can't extend this invitation, uh, I wouldn't be here. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, most people know me as a, as a writer and historian. And what most people don't realize is that I am, uh, my formal training is in graphic design and advertising. Um, I have a, a bachelor's in fine arts from Howard University. Uh, I used to work in a couple of advertising agencies uh, when I was much younger. And um, after graduating from college, two years after graduating from college, I started my own uh, graphic design studio. So uh, I understood from the time that I was a child how important images are. And as a result of my relationship with, uh, with uh, my brothers and sisters who are uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, I mentioned earlier Wade Noble, uh, the National Association of Black Psychologists, as well as uh, uh, Nichols, Lisa Hillier, Naeem Markvon, uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia Newton, who is a psychiatrist, who is a colleague of Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. Uh, they have helped to, and, and Richard King, and Richard King as well. Uh, they really helped me to understand the power of images uh, to affect and influence us on, on a subconscious level. As a matter of fact, uh, I read a paper about three months ago that stated that 95 to 97 percent of our thoughts are programmed in our subconsciousness by media that we internalize. So I understand very clearly that everything we see, everything that we hear, everything that we watch has been determined by people who don't look like us. And they understand very clearly that the main purpose of advertising and marketing is to get inside your head, to get you to spend money that you don't have and things that you don't need. So it's all about mental manipulation. Uh, and those people who are in that business understand that it is a business. And they don't care uh, about the people who internalize the messages. They don't care. And so it's important for me to understand that African, uh, I'll speak from, uh, perspective of, of my home country. Africans in America are the greatest consumers of media content in the United States of America. We watch almost twice as much television as any other segment of, of, of the population. And there's been uh, research done that shows that, um, that watching television diminishes your intellectual capacity. Mm -hmm. So it's no wonder that we're in the shape we're in the United States. So the key is to help make our people aware that um, all media affects us on a conscious and subconscious level, all media. Um, and, and through the uh, analyses that I've done, you mentioned uh, the analysis I did of Empire last year. A decade ago, I did an analysis of the movie um, um, Avatar. And just last month, I've been doing uh, several presentations on this new film, Get Out, and what all of that means. So uh, what I... What I do as a form of, I guess, relaxation is to analyze uh, media and, and then to share my analysis with people who have a desire to improve their quality of life. As I stated earlier, this information is not for everybody. So I'm, I'm very clear about that. Not everybody is going to get it. But for those who are interested in understanding how uh, others outside of our community shape our perceptions of self and our perceptions of the world, then for those who get it and want to do something to um, 
change the relationship and become the masters of your perception, then I share my research with them. Uh, and the idea is uh, to be fully aware of the fact that everything that comes into your body, you know, there's an old saying that you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And if you eat junk food, your, your body will be a temple of junk. Uh, but you are also what you listen to. You're also what you see. You're also what you read. Mm. And when we understand that everything that we internalize, mm. whether we eat it, drink it, listen to it, read it, or see it, affects us on a cellular mm. level. Mm -hmm. That's very basic and fundamental. Mm. Everything that you internalize affects you, affects you on a cellular level. Mm. So any man or woman who is serious about being a confident man or woman is going to master what they internalize. And any man or woman who happens to be a parent who loves their child will limit their child's exposure to media and will regulate what they internalize. Because if you don't, the children that you bring into the world will become monsters who will terrorize your community. Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why we find our communities in the sad state that they're in is because the parents are not doing their job. Uh, I, I, I live and die as a parent. I live and die by the reality that um, parents must first monitor themselves before they can monitor what goes on in their house, household. And to the extent to which parents do that, you will see a corresponding improvement in your community. So I put the onus on us. I understand that the European is our oppressor. I get that. I'm clear about that. Uh, but it's our ignorance that continues to allow his oppression to impact us in ways that we should have control over. Your oppressor does not have to be in your house. You turn off your television, your oppressor is not in your house. You turn off your radio or, or monitor what you listen to, then you monitor your oppressor's influence on your household. That's your domain. And we need to begin to understand that and exercise more control over our domain. And again, the extent to which we do that is the, is the extent to which we will see a quantitative improvement in the quality of our lives, the lives of our children, and the lives of our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Once again, I'm going to echo what the others said about welcome to the UK. Uh, I'm Brother Vasco from OneArmyRadio.com. I am um, one of these people who uh, think that I am spiritual. I meditate. And I've been coming across quite a lot of articles recently about the change in behavior patterns between school children who meditate yes. um, at the behest of the school or, or the parent and um, those children who do not meditate. And I will um, make a quote from the Dalai Lama who said that um, if every child were to meditate, then uh, we could wipe out violence in one generation. Mm -hmm. Right. Where do, you fit, where do you sit on that? Do you believe that uh, meditation is one of the um, ways forward for the black community? Sure. As opposed to religion, that is. All right. I appreciate your question. <laughs> um, and let me respond specifically to your question. Do I believe that meditation is the way forward? No, I don't believe. Uh, because belief is something you accept without proof. I know that meditation is one of many ways it can be used to advance us. And meditation has been given a bad, uh, bad rap uh, by religions. Uh, because uh, for some people, they believe, they believe, they believe that yeah. by you meditating, you open yourself up to the devil. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been around long enough. <laughs> I've been around long enough to know uh, that the devil ain't real. Mm. Um, so if the devil is not real, it means that God is not real. Yeah. Uh, which means that God is a man-made concept. That's yes, right. It's a man-made concept. Mm. Uh, and people believe in God. Mm -hmm and believe in the books written by God's chosen people, uh, primarily because they have not read. Uh, they're not familiar with how many religions have been used, uh, to paraphrase my, my good friend, my good teacher, uh, Dr. John Lee Clark, many religions uh, have been used as nothing more than male chauvinistic murder cults, where women are ostracized, the presence of women is minimized, um, and these so-called religions, these so-called pathways to God, have been used to justify some of the most ungodly behavior exhibited by human beings on this planet. So I'm not locked into uh, any religious 
ideology, any religious belief. Uh, I know that there is a creative force, a creative presence that operates throughout the, throughout the universe. I know nobody has the right to impose their religious beliefs on me. Uh, I, I'm fully uh, willing to accept anybody's religious faith. Everybody has the right to believe what they want to believe, but nobody has the right to impose their beliefs on me or anybody else. Uh, but with regards to an understanding of, of man and woman's relationship with the unseen, the creator of God, Allah, Jehovah, whatever term you want to use to describe it, uh, I know that uh, we are the instruments, we are the vessels which the creator manifests itself. And that in that sense, we are many creators. And I know that our ability to create is determined by what we think. And as I stated previously in answering the other question, our thoughts are not our own. Our thoughts have been programmed into our consciousness by our oppressor. So as a result, the thoughts that we think are thoughts that are designed to minimize our ability to create things that will create a, a, a positive existence within our environment. So it's by centering yourself. Some people may call it meditation. Others may call it uh, a mindfulness or thoughtfulness, but whatever, whatever term you use to describe it, by sitting down, by being still, by focusing, by aligning yourself with your ancestors, with the Orisha, the Obasun, whatever term you want to use, by aligning yourself with this invisible presence that pervades our, our, our entire environment, you can be still. And in that stillness, come to know things. And it is that knowing that lays down a path that validates whether that knowing is accurate or not. You know, um, so for those who are willing to be still, to take the time and on a regular basis be still and know themselves, be still to listen to the voice of, of their ancestors, to ask questions, to be unafraid to ask questions, and be open to receiving answers, then you will find that there is uh, another path to living life, a path that will, uh, as you suggested, that will minimize violence, but a path that will also lead to self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, when you are able to empower yourself, there is no need to impose violence on others, uh, because you understand that every person you see is but an extension of yourself. So when you empower yourself, you also are empowering others. And there's no need to inflict violence. The other important part of that equation is the understanding that whatever you do comes back to you. You do evil. You think evil. Evil comes back to you. You know, our minds are such that, um, and, and this is all part of something that, that, that I was introduced to uh, back in the 1970s. So I understand and I appreciate the power of thought and the power of focus and constructive thought, and how just by taking time out of your day every day to be still mm -hmm. and to reflect on, on your thoughts from the previous day or to project your thoughts into the coming day, we create our reality based upon our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and let me say that again because that's something I don't believe, it's something I know. We create our reality based on what you thought, what you think. So when you change your mind, you change your relationship to everything, that we are creators. And that's something that most religions uh, will never teach us. We are the instruments, we are the vessels which the creator God, Allah, Jehovah, uh, works through. So when we understand that, and we participate in activities that keep us connected with this source, and we practice what we know, that we change our relationship with ourselves, we change our relationship with those uh, with whom we interact, and when people of like mind come together, we change our environment, we change our communities, we change our schools, we change our households. So the key to, one of the keys to eliminating violence is to know yourself, is to limit your ingestion of, of media influences, and to take regular time to be still, and have conversations with your soul, with your ancestors, with your spirit. And then to work with people who also are, are, are like-minded people. And then to come together collectively to talk about what it is that we need as a community and then to do those things.
And when you do that on a consistent basis, you will see a direct cause and effect relationship between what you think and what you manifest in reality. And our oppressor knows that. Our oppressor understands that. That's why they place obstacles in our way on a regular basis. That's why they do everything within their power to disconnect us from this knowing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you truly understand the nature of who your enemy is, then you reach a point in your life where you're no longer afraid of that enemy. And um, you no longer um, give your power to that enemy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, in this instance, talking about what the white man has done, blah, 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 the white man has done this, white man has done that, and getting angry with him, only perpetuates his power. <laughs> if we could forget the white man mm -hmm. and think about us, mm -hmm. spend our time with us, yeah, yeah. spend our money with us, yeah. learn to yeah. love us, yeah, yeah. and we will see things change yeah. overnight. Yeah. And that's a message that uh, we need to be sharing with more of our people. Right. Uh, that's a message that needs to be uh, shared every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully that will be a message that will be received during uh, the time that I'll be here in London during my conversations with the community. And hopefully it will be a message that people will receive favorably and act upon. Um, and we'll see a profound difference in, in your community. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate your question. Thank you. Okay. My name is Cecil Bertsmore, and um, I'm with a little organization called the African Society Community Forum. And I just have a little question. It may even be mischievous, but I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking at your um, paragraph, page 45 of your uh, excellent book, and it has major rivers of, of the world. And the Niger doesn't appear to be there. And it seems to me that it's one of the major rivers of the world because of its impact on, on West Africa. Mm -hmm. And, I, and the, the white people knew that, which is why they spoke so much about it at the Congress of Berlin, mm -hmm. along with the, the, the River Congo. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like your response to how you came to leave the Niger. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, sure. Now, um, two things. One. Uh, major rivers of the world, major is determined by the length of the river. Yeah. Right? Uh, other point is... By the length of the river? The, the length of the river. Well, so the Nile well, River is the longest river. You've got the Thames in there, I'm very sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good observation. The other thing is, that book was written 25 years ago. I had here 25 years ago. <laughs> Everything changes. So, um, um, as... As, uh, since this is the 25 year, 25th year anniversary of that book, I'm in the process of revising and republishing that book. And Cecil, I would take your suggestion to heart, and I would make a modification on that page uh, as a result of you bringing that to my attention. Because as I said earlier, I now know, I now know something that I didn't know 25 years ago about the significance of the Niger River and our association with uh, the migrations from the Nile to the Niger. So, one of the things that I will be uh, the first to acknowledge is that I don't know everything, uh, that I'm learning every day, and that the more that I learn, the more it helps me become a better person. And I always make it a constant point to revise my presentations, to revise my publications. So uh, the revised version of that book and subsequent books that I will write will have a different orientation than the things that I've written in the past. I'm not the same person I was. Hell, I'm not the same person I was yesterday morning. <laughs> I'm changing every day. I'm growing every day. Um, and as a result of my growing, I understand that we all are growing every day. We all have an obligation and a responsibility to help each other grow. So I'm always open to accepting um, uh, critiques uh, of my work because I'm still a work in progress. Yeah. Right. And I'm still working on, on improving myself. So um, uh, when the revised version of Now Body comes out, I'll be thinking of you. Right. 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 Hi, I'm, I'm Blossom. Hey, Blossom. I'm, I'm new Blossom. to all of this room. Okay. I'm learning, and I'd like you to um, change a lot of things. Um, Brother W borrowed my question, yes, but yeah. in that question you answered, um, when you, you enlighten us to something, we're mentor, 
So I will endeavor from now on not to use that word. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. I was, I'm blessed, you know, that someone like you could take um, how my ideas are shared in this room to be with us. Um, I don't have a question in, in particular, but there's something that keeps bugging me in mind. Brother here, we were talking about it this morning, the best way to go about um, helping people, those who are sleeping, who are steeped in religion, um, just how to, you know, begin to open a dialogue with mm. them to get them interested in my, oh, these words are not fun. <laughs> I mean, I get other people who mean a lot to me. Sure. Um, you know, just how to help them to move from that where they are to somewhere else. Sure. Uh, and that's, that's a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a question that I'm asked quite frequently. And uh, the answer that I would give you now is different from the answer I would have given you five years ago or 10 years ago uh, as a result of my growing and learning. And, and I would tell you this, that um, I've learned to respect other people and the faith that they adhere to. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone has the right to interpret the creator the way that they want to. But as I also said, nobody has the right to impose their interpretation on me. Uh, and that I will ask of a person that um, my understanding of your relationship with God, the creator of our lives, is, is, is really determined by how you treat people who don't believe what you believe. Period. So uh, for those family members and friends who subscribe to a specific religious ideology, um, <coughs> I don't impose my thoughts on them, but I live my life in such a way that they can see that my life is a reflection of what I know. And I know many people who are involved in the church who live with the contradictions in the church, live with the contradictions in the church, and some are asking questions, others are too afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know many people in the church who are looking for direction. Mm -hmm. So just by living a truthful life, for those that are looking for direction, they know, they will learn that, that you can find truth anywhere. And when they see someone who's living a truthful life, they will come to you. And then that's the time to begin to have conversation with that person because now they're ready to receive. Because <coughs> quite quite naturally, um, quite naturally, you know, there's this thing called cognitive dissonance, where uh, we are socialized to be afraid of things that we're unfamiliar with, and just thinking about or talking about those things that we're unfamiliar with will make us ill, physically ill. People will shut down when they hear you discussing things that they have been socialized to believe were evil or, or uncivilized. Mm -hmm. So you need to be aware of that and need to find ways to neutralize or to work around these mental, emotional, psychological, religious, and spiritual barriers that are there. And that um, also understand that you can't save everybody. <laughs> And a lot of people who will be lost are people that we know and love dearly. You can't save everybody. Mm -hmm. But if someone that you love comes to you and needs your help, then you're <coughs> obligated to provide whatever assistance you can. And if that person is sincere, then they will express their gratitude in uh, working with you on, on future endeavors. So you gotta love people and respect them where they are and oftentimes you have to leave them alone, which hurts you a lot if you feel that they're moving in, in, in the wrong direction. But some people have to be loved from a distance. Uh, and we have to work consistently uh, to live the best quality of life uh, uh, that we can and to demonstrate that so that when the time comes and you're able to help somebody who genuinely desires your help. I hope that. Yeah, thank you.